inflict all of that. Uh, we've actually had some practice doing this. Um, you may recall back in February, uh, all these same actors uh, converged around a town called uh, Al Bab up to the east of Aleppo. And uh, we deconflicted that uh, successfully. And then you may recall, uh, probably in the May, June timeframe, uh, all these same actors uh, converged again south of Raqqa uh, in the area of the Tabka uh, city and Tabka airfield. We were able to work through that then, and uh, those uh, rehearsals, if you will, have allowed us to come up with uh, measures that seem to work. So uh, we're having a conversation uh, with the Russians. We're trying to deconflict this uh, in the future. And uh, we have uh, lines that are agreed to that will cover uh, much of the Middle Euphrates River Valley now. Uh, not all of it yet, uh, but we'll get to that when the time comes. So I'm reasonably confident that uh, we'll be able to work through this. Uh, everyone that's converging down there is trying to defeat ISIS as a first priority. And uh, we'll use that to our advantage to work through it. Uh, your second question about um, how will we ensure that there's a suitable force uh, to go to this area and liberate this area. Well, first of all, uh, I'm not sure it's our responsibility to assure the, ensure that. Um, I think uh, what we have is we're supporting Syrians liberating Syria. And um, our Syrian partners have shown a remarkable uh, facility for finding uh, suitable partners. Uh, in fact, uh, I watched them do this in Manbij, I watched them do this in Tabka, and now I'm watching them do it for the third time in Raqqa. And uh, you mentioned uh, a Kurd force, but the Syrian Democratic Forces uh, uh, comprise of about 50,000 fighters, half of whom are Arabs. And um, what I've watched with this force is that they, uh, first of all, uh, solicit volunteers and recruits from the area to be liberated and they form the leading elements of the force uh, from those uh, people. Uh, so I think that uh, they'll, they'll, they'll do this much the same way they're doing it in Raqqa. Uh, they'll uh, recruit people from the Deir Ezzor province um, and the middle Euphrates River Valley and uh, they'll be part of the campaign and um, I'm uh, reasonably confident based on past history that uh, they'll find a force, they'll make a force that's acceptable uh, to the people down there. Now I'll just give you a little vignette we see playing out around uh, Raqqa and Tabqa uh, every day. Um, it doesn't really matter what that force uh, is comprised of, you know, the ethnic background, uh, religious background, uh, what we see is we see people fleeing towards the, our Syrian partners every day. They're fleeing from ISIS towards uh, our Syrian partners. They're fleeing from the Syrian regime towards our Syrian partners because they know that there's a uh, safety uh, there. Uh, so anyway, uh, with, with that experience, um, I'm reasonably confident that that force will also find uh, suitable partners to defeat ISIS in the middle of Euphrates River Valley. Thank you, Idris Ali from Reuters. General, when we were in uh, Baghdad last week, uh, with all the briefings and all that we got, the impression that I got was that Talafar would be a tough fight. There were about 2,000 ISIS fighters in and, in, in and around the city. So I mean, what happened? What happened with those fighters since it obviously was uh, sort of encircled? Where did they, you know, did you kill all 2,000? Sort of how was it swifter than, why was it swifter than you thought? And then I have another follow-up on Syria. Uh, yeah, I remember our discussion a week or so ago here in uh, Baghdad. Um, I think what I said is we estimate there's somewhere between one and 2,000 fighters in uh, Tel Afer. Uh, and uh, quite honestly, our Initial battle damage assessment is over a thousand enemy fighters uh, killed or captured already. Uh, probably uh, five to seven hundred of them in the neighborhood of Talafar City itself. And then uh, the, those uh, remaining fighters withdrew from Talafar City to the north. And um, 
They withdrew some 10 or 20 kilometers to some pretty rough country and some small villages to the north of Talafar. And uh, in that process, we think we've killed somewhere between three and 500. So somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 enemy fighters we think that we've killed. The Kurdish Peshmerga have uh, estimated that they've killed uh, somewhere between 130 and 170 fighters trying to flee through northward and northwest through the Kurdish defensive lines. Um, so there was a pretty good isolation around uh, Talafar. And uh, the Iraqi security forces and the coalition went there to annihilate uh, the ISIS forces that were there in uh, Talafar. And I think we've done that. Um, I think that um, I think there are probably some still hiding in the very rough country uh, to the north of Talafar, but uh, not in large numbers would be my guess. And I think we've accounted for a lot of them. And just to follow up on this ISIS convoy going into eastern Syria, I mean, I, I get that sort of w it's within the law of armed conflict to strike, um, you know, if it's ISIS fighters and not necessarily hit the convoy. But the criticism is that morally, you know, striking a convoy with 300 women and children um, just to sort of make a point, because they can obviously go around where you've struck, is not the correct way to go about doing this. If you could sort of uh, tell us the rationale on why you decided to, you know, temporarily sort of block this convoy uh, with women and children. Okay. So, uh, first of all, uh, this is a convoy of ISIS fighters. Uh, they ha we believe some of them have their uh, family members with them. These are ISIS fighters that the Syrian regime cut a deal with to move through Syria from their west uh, border, western border with Lebanon, through Syria and put them off on buses on their eastern border next to Iraq. That's what they're doing. Uh, so we decided to go look for these buses, and we found them. And let me make it clear, we have not struck this convoy at all. Um, no women and children have been harmed on this convoy, although I'd very much like to get at the ISIS fighters on that convoy. Uh, we've resisted that. What we have done is we've seen the Syrian regime bring these ISIS fighters with their machine guns, uh, which they posted on social media, pictures of masked terrorists on, bu on Greyhound-like buses um, with their machine guns in their laps. And you can check it on social media and see it for yourself. Uh, so we didn't make a deal with ISIS. And we're going to pursue ISIS wherever we find them. Uh, so they stopped on the, near uh, Abu Kamal uh, on the eastern, in the eastern part of Syria and along the border with Iraq. And they waited to link up with ISIS. And so we watched. And when ISIS came out to link up with them, we started striking ISIS. And again, we haven't struck the convoy. But we have struck every ISIS fighter and or vehicle that has tried to approach that convoy. And uh, we'll continue to do that. Thanks to Joe Tabbitt from al -Hurra. Thank you, Major. Uh, Jen Thousand, thank you for doing this. Uh, my question, I want to go back to your opening statement. Uh, you mentioned many victories over the last two years from Fallujah to Mosul to Shadadi, Manbij. My question for you is, what do you think, how the United States, what, do, what the United States need to do to safeguard what has been achieved in the last two or three years? What's your vision in regards to the post-counter uh, ISIS? Do you see a long-term commitment for the United States in both Iraq and Syria? Okay. Uh, so I think, uh, as I understand your question, a little hard time hearing that, but I think you ask, uh, what, what does the United States need to do to uh, secure uh, the victory in Iraq and Syria uh, post-conflict? Um, first of all, we need to de focus on defeating ISIS. Um, there are still about uh, one and a half, two million people 
under ISIS bondage. Um, there's still more than 25,000 square kilometers held uh, by ISIS, some major population centers in Iraq and Syria. And uh, so we have to focus first on the defeat of ISIS, military defeat of ISIS. Then I think it's uh, less uh, about what the United States must do, but first it's about what I Iraq and, and Syria must do. In Iraq, for example, um, I think part of the rise of ISIS was um, disenfranchised peoples, most of them Sunnis, uh, who looked at uh, Baghdad and they didn't see their government representing them or their interests or their future. And uh, I think that's probably the most important thing that uh, the people of Iraq, the government of Iraq has to do is it has to reach out, uh, reconcile, bring all Iraqis together and be the government uh, of all Iraqis. Uh, so um, I, that's probably the second thing. Beat ISIS, then the Iraqi uh, government um, has to uh, represent all Iraqis. In Syria, it's a harder question and I think that there's probably uh, a lot of diplomacy that has to happen. Uh, I think for Syria, I'm just going to focus on defeating ISIS and let uh, give time for the di diplomats uh, to work through uh, to find a, a, a solution to the way ahead there. As far as uh, a longer term presence here, um, I think there's a, a desire, I know that there's a desire for that on the part of the Iraqi government and the Iraqi security forces. And uh, uh, our government uh, has engaged in uh, conversations with the Iraqi security forces and I'm hopeful that an arrangement will be uh, made uh, to that end in the future. I think that, um, uh, you know, we saw what happened, we all saw what happened in 2011. Uh, when we parted ways uh, completely, and uh, personally, I, my personal view is I don't want to, I wouldn't want to repeat that. So I think that uh, uh, our governments will work out something that'll work for the future. But I think the main thing is we have to defeat ISIS, and uh, Baghdad's got to reach out and put their arms around all Iraqis. And I, my sense is that the uh, Iraqi leaders that I deal with, that's exactly what they want to do. Question, sir. Uh, do you still see any importance in capturing uh, Baghdadi? Uh, I think you said any importance in capturing Baghdadi. Um, so uh, I'd be happy to uh, capture uh, Baghdadi. Um, I don't know who wouldn't. Um, I'd, I think I'd be just, just as equally satisfied just killing him. And uh, if he's alive out there somewhere, we're looking for him every day. I don't think he's dead. We're looking for him every day. Uh, when we find him, I think we'll probably just try to kill him first. Uh, probably, probably not worth all the trouble to try to capture him. Uh, that's, that's my own personal thought on it. Next to Tom Bowman from National Public Radio. Hey, I wonder if you could get back to the convoy for a second. You talked about these buses that you're not hitting and uh, any ISIS vehicles that come up near them, you'll take those out. So are these buses still in the same location? Are they essentially just kind of trapped there? And uh, talk about this as a, I would guess, uh, re reoccurring problem for you. ISIS could continue doing this kind of thing, move out of, a, let's say, Raqqa or someplace else with uh, their family members or civilians on their vehicles, and you're not going to be able to strike them kind of what we saw in Manvich. Okay, uh, well, uh, first of all, I'd, I'd uh, point out that uh, we did see that in uh, Manvich, but it hasn't always worked out that way for ISIS. So, for example, uh, the example in Fallujah, Iraq, uh, ISIS tried to leave there, and um, we were able to uh, uh, strike their convoys and, and uh, essentially slaughter uh, ISIS fighters in large numbers. In uh, Manbij, uh, there was a different outcome. Um, in Tabka, uh, back in April, May time frame, um, they uh, tried to uh, execute a negotiated withdrawal. Uh, we weren't party to that agreement and we struck their withdrawing column uh, to the extent that we could. 
so trying to uh, dissuade that type of activity. Uh, this is a little bit different. This is not really a breakout. This is sort of a break in. So they, they talked their way out of, uh, with the Syrian regime out of western Syria and they've gone now to the east side and uh, the Syrian regime appears to be quite happy to deliver them uh, right to Abu Kamal on the Iraqi border. I know that the, the uh, government of Iraq doesn't appreciate that much and uh, we don't appreciate it. We weren't a, par a party to the deal. Uh, so uh, what's become of the buses there? Um, they actually started moving back towards the interior of uh, Syria and uh, so we're, we're just letting them go. Uh, if they try to uh, uh, get to uh, the edge of ISIS territory and uh, link up with uh, ISIS there, we'll work hard to disrupt that. Said how again? What created the roads? Prevent them from moving? What will you do? Well, we have all kinds of ways, and I'd prefer that the ISIS find out about that when they make their attempt. Next to Lori Milroy with Kurdistan 24. Thank you, General. Uh, you were just in Erbil and met with President Barzani. Could you tell us about that meeting? Um, uh, yes, I was in Erbil and I met with President Barzani. What did you dis uh, did you just could you tell us something about what you discussed with him? Um, well, well, we discussed the war, uh, we discussed the Talafer operation, um, we discussed Mosul and Mosul security, and we discussed a, a range of other topics, uh, most of which uh, I'm a partner on but not the lead for, and so I'll, I'll let others talk about those topics. Are you satisfied with the contribution of the Peshmerga to the war? About, about the war. Uh, yes. I think I heard your question. Am I satisfied with the contributions of the Peshmerga towards the war? Yes. So uh, p people probably don't have a good appreciation for this, but uh, I certainly do. Um, the Peshmerga were instrumental in stopping the onslaught of ISIS in uh, 2014 and 2015. Uh, across much of northern Iraq, it was the Kurdish Peshmerga who held the line. Um, and so they've been holding that line uh, ever since for three years. And um, I think people kind of lose sight of that. It seems like the Kurds aren't doing anything. <laughs> They're defending still across hundreds of kilometers uh, of Iraq in contact with ISIS every day. Um, I saw them do incredible work uh, for the liberation of Mosul, especially for the initial stages of Mosul. Uh, they, uh, they coordinated very effectively and constructively with the Iraqi security forces. Uh, they allowed the Iraqi security forces to stage for the attack uh, in Kurdish-held uh, areas. Uh, the Peshmerga then made the initial attacks to advance the flight. Uh, towards Mosul, the forward line of troops towards Mosul, and allow the Iraqi security forces to close with the city and make their assault into the city, their breach into the city, without loss prior to actually getting to the breach point. These are uh, very uh, in, uh, key accomplishments. They also liberate a number of towns and villages around uh, Mosul from ISIS. Uh, since then, uh, they have been uh, containing uh, Talafer, for example, in the Hoesia pocket uh, for nine months. And now, most recently, in the Battle of Talafer, uh, I mentioned earlier uh, that they've killed somewhere between 130 or 170, um, and with some loss to Peshmerga. Uh, there were ISIS attacks on their uh, defensive line to try to break out from encirclement out of uh, Talafer. Uh, some of these attacks involved um, women, female suicide bombers uh, who killed Peshmerga who were, who were trying to let uh, the women and children escape and instead uh, I, uh, female ISIS suicide bombers exploded themselves and killed the Peshmerga soldiers. They've he held a stalwart defense there north of Talafer and have shaped the battlefield there and attrited the escaping enemy to a significant degree. So I'm 
uh, I am pretty happy with uh, the contributions of the Peshmerga, and there'll be more uh, contributions as we look towards uh, Huija, which is contained uh, to the east entirely by the uh, Kurdish Peshmerga. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Rossier with Bloomberg. We have heard in Washington that the White House has decentralized decision-making, tactical decision-making, down to your level and below, more than the Obama administration had. Uh, Brett McGurk has laid this out a few times in Washington. Can you give a couple practical exa examples of how this decentralization has helped in your campaign to so-called uh, annihilate ISIS? And then I have a follow-up on a different subject. Okay, uh, I will say that uh, uh, the uh, current administration has uh, pushed decision making uh, down into the uh, military chain of command. And I don't know of a commander in our armed forces that doesn't appreciate that. Um, I'll, I'll uh, prefer not to uh, go into uh, specific examples. Uh, I will say that um, probably um, uh, a key result of that is that um, I, we don't get uh, second guessed a lot. Our judgment here on the battlefield uh, in the forward areas is uh, trusted and um, we don't get uh, 20 questions uh, with every action that happens on the battlefield and every action that we take. And I, again, I think um, uh, every commander uh, that I know of, appreciates uh, being given the authority and responsibility, uh, and then the trust and, and a backing uh, to implement that. So uh, I, I, that's what I'll say. You had a follow-up question? On the expeditionary targeting force, we don't hear a lot about that, but what impact broadly has, had, has that special operations force had on shaping the battlefields in Mosul, Araka, Talafar, you mentioned precision strikes against leaders in Talafar. Were those strikes executed by the expeditionary targeting force? Um, I won't really talk about the operations of uh, any of our specific units. Uh, suffice it to say, we have a lot of capabilities here and we use them. Uh, as far as your uh, question about uh, the role of SOF, uh, SOF has been uh, Special Operations Forces, uh, both U.S. and Coalition Special Operations Forces, and we have a significant uh, coalition contribution with Special Operations. Uh, they've been significant. Uh, they have, in the earlier days, uh, they were probably the weight of the effort um, because uh, nations were willing to put Special Operations troops where they were not willing to put uh, maybe uh, uh, general purpose forces. So uh, in Iraq, they've been absolutely instrumental in uh, shaping this fight over the last three years and in specifically targeting uh, enemy key leaders and special military capabilities like their chemical warfare enterprise, their drone uh, enterprise, so those are some examples. Uh, external operations plotting and planning are other examples of where the special operations forces contribute uh, greatly. I'd like to put to rest a little bit uh, this, uh, this uh, thought that uh, SOF are doing all the work over here. Uh, with the uh, approach of the Mosul operation, um, the Iraqi security forces involved, that formation became much too large for SOF to be the only uh, advisors. And so over time, we have committed uh, more and more advisors from the general purpose forces. Uh, and uh, the two brigades uh, from the, um, uh, the 18th Airborne Corps that I've worked with here, uh, 2nd Brigade of the 101st and 2nd Brigade of the 82nd Airborne, uh, had a very substantial role in the Battle of Mosul. In fact, uh, the, the, during the Battle of Mosul, uh, their, uh, the General Purpose Forces' uh, role eclipsed that of SOF. Not their role didn't eclipse it, but their, their, their size of their force in the fight eclipsed that of special operating forces. Now in Syria it's still a little bit different. Uh, we have added uh, special uh, general purpose forces there but by and large our Syria campaign has started in 2014 in, as a mostly special operation forces endeavor and it still remains that. Um, however, uh, I was just there um, 
yesterday, in fact. Uh, and um, uh, I saw General Purpose Force and Special Operators working together side by side on the battlefield in Syria. It's still largely, though, a soft uh, lead. Uh, the character of the operation is Special Operations Forces. There's a lot of General Purpose Forces over there in support, though. You know, at Talafar, the precision strikes against le ISIS leaders, were those executed by soft forces or Iraqi General Purpose? Um, so our, um, our enterprise uh, the, for striking uh, high-value individuals or, uh, or ISIS leaders uh, is very integrated. Uh, you'd be hard-pressed to say it's a special operations process or it's a uh, general purpose force process. It's too integrated for that. It's very much blended, uh, our strike enterprise here. Um, most of the... Uh, precision strikes against known ISIS leaders is conducted by the coalition. Uh, though, although uh, the Iraqis do have some capabilities to do that, and uh, they will identify a key leader on the battlefield, and uh, they will make a precision strike on, on these leaders. Uh, these are enabling and enhancing capabilities. These are not decisive. Uh, wh what was decisive is... Um, tens of thousands of Iraqi security forces attacking on five axes uh, simultaneously into Talafar like a steamroller. That's what was uh, decisive. Matthew Barber Star with CNN. General Townsend, to go back to Joe's question on Baghdadi, you seemed, you were definitive. You said you think he's alive. <laughs> so you believe he's alive. So can you elaborate a little bit at the end of your tour here, because you're leaving, um, what makes you come to the conclusion he's alive? Does that suggest you know where he may be, even if you can't tell us? And you also seem to be fairly definitive that the orders are first to kill. Capture if you can, but you'd rather see him killed. So is that the orders your troops are you know, basically operating under? Okay, uh, Barbara, thanks for the question. I seem to remember my last Pentagon press conference when you were very interested also in Baghdadi's whereabouts and what we were going to do with him then. This is, a, uh, this is apparently a hobby of yours, Barbara. Uh, so, look, I really don't know where he is. I think this is the same answer I gave last time. I really don't. Do I believe he's alive? Yes. Why? Uh, because I've seen no convincing evidence, intelligence, or open source, or other rumor, or otherwise, that he's dead. So therefore, I believe he's alive. Um, there are also some indicators and in intelligence channels that he's still alive. Where is he? I don't have a clue. He could be anywhere in the world for all I know. Um, here's what I think. I think he's somewhere in Iraq and Syria. I think he's probably somewhere in the middle Euphrates River Valley. Remember, I think the Secretary of Defense said it last week or so, and I said it uh, just a few minutes ago, the last stand of ISIS will be in the middle Euphrates River Valley. Uh, that's where they believe their last sanctuary is. So I think he's probably somewhere down there. That's just an educated guess made after, you know, doing this for a year and scratching off a hole. He's not in Mosul. He's not in Talafar. I don't think he's in Raqqa anymore, so just kind of reducing the list of possible places where he could be, I kind of conclude he's in the Merv somewhere. We're looking for him every day. I could follow up. So my question as a reporter to you... Uh, the, the, go ahead. My question as a reporter to you is you have just said you do have intelligence indicators he's alive, so that informs what you said is your guess. You do have reason to believe as a commanding general. Yes, I said I thought he was alive. And my question to follow that up, when you say you believe he's likely in the Euphrates, middle Euphrates River Valley, you, in, you had said to Michael Gordon that you are working on deconfliction with the Russians in advance there, if I understood you correctly. Could you expand a little bit? When you say deconfliction, 
we have mostly understood that to mean air operations in the near term uh, across Syria, sort of on a day-to-day -day or an operational basis. Is this now a different type of deconfliction discussion you're having with the Russians in advance? Uh, are you sort of dividing up the areas in, in the middle Euphrates River Valley where you're going to operate? It seems a bit different, but perhaps I'm misunderstanding you. Okay, uh, so the uh, prior to about um, February, uh, the deconfliction that we were doing with the Russians was done uh, exclusively by our air force, uh, air forces, uh, central uh, air forces, and they were uh, talking to, uh, to the Russians to deconflict air operations, starting with uh, the convergence of the flots that I mentioned earlier around Al Bab in February. Uh, we saw suddenly the need for a ground component for that. Uh, we started thinking about how to go about doing that, and we started looking to get the resources. We had to have some special telephone lines, and we had to find the right interpreters. Uh, we kept working on that kind of slowly. Uh, this became a, a real priority in the May time frame with the convergence of uh, these forces, again, south of Tabka, as I previously mentioned. It was there. Uh, in uh, the convergence of forces around Topka where we understood this, uh, there is a definitely a ground component to this uh, deconfliction. And if we want to avoid inadvertent uh, clashes, uh, li linking up and, uh, on the battlefield with another friendly element, known friendly element that you actually have a link up plan with is a very dangerous operation. Well, well known in our, in our military that it's difficult to link up with someone while in contact with the enemy and um, especially in the dark. So it gets even tougher when you have a force that uh, uh, may be something other than uh, friendly, uh, not necessarily an adversary, but something other than friendly, and you don't have great communications with them and you don't have an agreed upon plan. Well, then, and then, and then you add the enemy there and it becomes fraught with uh, friction. So. We knew we had to have this deconfliction system, and we uh, have now acquired that at uh, the CJTF headquarters. So now there's two nodes for deconfliction with the Russians. Uh, the Air Force, uh, comp the Air Component has uh, their, their node, and we now have a node here at the CJTF uh, headquarters. Uh, so we can do that. So uh, I think that uh, this becomes, this, it becomes almost a daily fact of life. In fact, we probably talk to the Russians. Between the air component and my headquarters, we talk to the Russians. Somebody's talking to the Russians multiple times a day to deconflict our operations. Um, so I think that's, we, we've got the, the system in place we need to do it. And um, it's just a fact of life as we operate in a greater proximity to each other in the middle Euphrates River Valley. Can I just make sure I understand? Have you already, established your deconfliction zones in the ERV, or is that still to come? Your deconfliction with the Russians, do you, have you divided it up with them? Well, um, so uh, remember that I said we've established some measures uh, south of Raqqa, and uh, those, ro those measures uh, extend uh, to the east of Raqqa, and uh, since about the middle of June, second week of June, they've held, uh, and we haven't had friction. Uh, they've observed the measures we put in place, and we've observed the measures, and our partners have observed the measures we put in place. And uh, the, the discussions every day really are just to make sure that everybody knows what everybody's doing and uh, not to trip on each other, really, and that the measures are still in place and we're all observing them. That's kind of how the conversations go. Uh, there, I, I told you that, uh, uh, that we've already established the measures that are in place that go down into the MIRV uh, a ways. I won't be specific, any more specific than that. And uh, there, there'll be other discussions. When the time comes, we'll work out other measures in the future that'll cover the entire area that needs to be covered. Now to Corey Dickstein, the Stars and Stripes. Uh, thanks for doing this, sir. Um, I want to ask, uh, on the, the Iraqi security forces, uh, they've obviously improved immensely in the last couple of years uh, since uh, ISIS overran them in 2014. 
but that, in 2014, they were largely a, you know, a US trained and equipped force. So my question is, what is different as, you know, we're nearing the end of ISIS in Iraq, what's different about the Iraqi security forces today than it was when we left in 2011? Um, and, and what do they need to continue to improve on to ensure ISIS or um, a similar group doesn't, you know, reclaim territory somewhere in the country uh, in the in the future? Okay. Uh, so your questions about uh, you know the Iraqi security forces and uh, what's different now than about them in 2014. I think you have to go back to uh, 2011, uh, when uh, the coalition and the, uh, the, the Iraqis uh, parted ways. I think what, what I uh, can gather from looking at uh, the period from 2011 to 2014 or 2013 is that um, uh, the Iraqi security forces largely stopped training. I'm not really sure what the mechanism of that, what the reason behind that was, but uh, they did very little training uh, after 2011. Uh, and uh, there was a significant um, um, change out, turbulence, personnel turbulence, particularly in their leadership ranks. And I think the previous Iraqi government was more interested in, in putting um, uh, leaders into position uh, who were um, of like mind than maybe uh, leaders who would, uh, by merit, um, protect the nation. So uh, then we saw, you know, ISIS arrive on the scene. And you see some dynamics there, but at the time, uh, ISIS, like a juggernaut, kind of gained uh, steam as they rolled across Syria and into Iraq. And um, I think in the minds of the Iraqis, they were 10 feet tall. Uh, we know that Mosul fell to probably less than a thousand ISIS fighters. Uh, we know that um, uh, Ramadi was largely uh, uh, given up uh, to uh, ISIS, and um, the, the army was uh, battered and bruised and nearly defeated on the outskirts of Baghdad in, in uh, the fall of 2014. So what changed? Well, first of all, uh, the coalition arrived, so they had some partners to help them. And it's always, you know, better to fight uh, your enemies with the help of others. And so the coalition arrived and started helping. Uh, we also started, we arrived and started uh, training and uh, training them again. And uh, there's, you know, professional armies, when they're not fighting, they're training to fight. And if they're doing something other than training to fight, they're not going to be a successful or a victorious army. Uh, I think also the government of Iraq also realized that they needed leaders who can get the job done, and they started reappointing uh, leaders to key positions uh, that would be able to command in battle successfully. Uh, so that rebuilding process went on in 2014 and 2015, and then in late 2015, the Iraqi security forces went on the attack again. And um, they haven't lost ground since. Basically, they've been taking ground back ever since. Uh, and ISIS has not gained new ground in that time frame. Uh, and it, you can see it. Uh, and then I think uh, there's another dynamic here that happens. As an army wins battles, its confidence grows. And um, I think that they're at a place right now uh, where after the victory in Mosul, I, they, they fought for nine continuous months um, in Mosul. Um, that's a remarkable feat for any army. And uh, they've emerged from that stronger, uh, battle hard. they're trained, they went into it trained, they've emerged from it battle hardened. Their leaders have learned a lot, their soldiers have learned a lot, and they have a level of confidence now that I saw play out in the Battle of Tel Afar. Um, I don't think they're overconfident. They're not there, and that's a danger, but uh, they're, they're a battle-hardened and confident uh, security force. And uh, there's still work to be done. There's more training to be done. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll do our after-action review of Tel Afar. And uh, what I saw them do is I saw them apply the lessons of Mosul to Tel Afar, and we're going to help them apply uh, the lessons of Tel Afar and Mosul to their next fight. 
so I think that's the, the big difference, really. Uh, uh, good leadership by necessity uh, and hard training uh, and then some battlefield experience. Next to Ryan Brown, CNN. General, thank you for doing this. Uh, I just want to follow up on the reports of clashes uh, in the area around Manbij between coalition forces and Turkish backed <coughs> rebels. Are you confident that you've been able to communicate with Turkey, your counterparts in Turkey, to get them to stop their proxies from doing that kind of thing? Or are you changing or adjusting kind of the coalition presence there uh, to prevent those kind of co clashes in the future? Okay, uh, so um, we actually haven't had uh, these clashes that you're referring to now in probably, uh, I think, about 10 days or so. And uh, what we were seeing um, about two weeks ago uh, were some of the um, uh, Free Syrian Army um, opposition, Syrian opposition uh, fighters in the uh, area controlled by the Turk military were uh, firing upon uh, the Manbij uh, area there, where there are uh, some U.S. forces, coalition forces there. Uh, we uh, uh, identified this to our Turkish allies, our NATO allies, Turkey, and uh, they have, I think, taken the appropriate measures to uh, get that under control. Uh, Turkey is a member of the coalition. Uh, They've been a valuable member, a uh, valuable partner in the fight against ISIS in, uh, particularly in northern Syria, where uh, they liberated with uh, um, uh, Syrian uh, partner forces a significant chunk of northern Syria to include uh, the uh, iconic uh, capital of uh, ISIS Caliphate, Dabiq, uh, and uh, the, the city of Al Bab, just to mention a few. Uh, places. So uh, Turkey's done uh, great work uh, with the coalition um, and uh, I think that uh, they've gotten that under control and I think we had some opposition uh, units, elements there on their side that were um, uh, kind of acting on their own and I believe it's uh, gotten, it's been put under control now and we, like I said it's been quiet now for going on I think about 10 days, maybe a little longer. Next to Jennifer Griffin, Fox News. Hi, General Townsend. Your time in Iraq has overlapped two administrations in this fight against ISIS. Can you tell us what the biggest difference in the last six months in terms of being a commanding general and the way the ISIS fight was pursued, how different it is from the prior administration? What is the biggest difference for you as a commander? Um, well, I think the, um, some of the, the, dis the differences, look, both administrations, as would any U.S. administration, both administrations were, I think, all in on defeating ISIS in this region. Now, that's why this CJTF was uh, stood up uh, three years ago. Uh, so I think that is common uh, to both. And... Uh, in macro, I think, the approach has been uh, very similar. Uh, there are some specific instances, which I kind of talked about with an earlier answer to an earlier question, uh, that uh, I think the current administration has uh, empowered uh, the chain of command uh, to uh, make more decisions uh, on their own and has then given uh, top cover uh, to the chain of command I think, for the decisions that are being made. And I think that's important, and that has, uh, just that alone has effects that uh, reverberate throughout a military organization when they feel like they've been given the, the, the authority and uh, the trust uh, to act and act aggressively. Then commanders now uh, don't, aren't constantly uh, calling back to higher headquarters asking for permission, but they're free to act. And uh, I think that's probably uh, very uh, empowering for uh, any commander in our armed forces. Thank you. Now to Paul Hanley with Agence France Presse. Hi, General, when we were in Erbil last week, uh, uh, an official of the Peshmerga 
uh, suggested that they had hoped you would go to Hawija uh, ahead of Talafar, and he said that after Talafar, that should be next. Um, is that on the menu for the, for the next actions, and are the ISF uh, ready, or do they need a break before they go there? And then I have a separate follow-up. Um, the uh, Iraqi security forces will be ready for their next operation, and I would prefer not to discuss the sequence of our operations here in this open source, open media <laughs> forum here. Uh, ISIS is probably watching as well, and they'd probably appreciate me telling you where our next operation will be. So I'll just, uh, I'll take a pass on that one. Thank you. What's your follow-up? Oh, on that, the, the Peshmerga official, although he's speaking through an interpreter, seemed a little bit... Uh, uh, anxious to get going there, they seem. Uh, I maybe even peeved that uh, hadn't gone gone there yet. Um, I'm sorry, I, I'm not following your. I didn't get that at all. Something about an interpreter hadn't gone there yet. I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you said. Peshmerga official was speaking through an interpreter, so we couldn't, you know, be sure of his uh, his feelings. But he's they. He, he sounded a little bit peeved that there wasn't a move yet on, on uh, Hawija. Okay. So there's a guy who's talking to an interpreter, and we're not really sure what he said, and uh, he seemed peeved, and you want me to comment on that. Like I said, I'll pass, and uh, what's your follow-up question? Okay, on the buses um, uh, with the ISIS uh, fighters, are those buses moving now? Where are they in Syria? And um, why didn't you just block their way and say, starve them out? Uh, okay, uh, I think you asked me where uh uh, I'm sorry, probably not coming in real clear, but I think you asked me where ISIS fighters are in Syria and then something about starve them out. Uh, so um, I'll give it, I'll try to answer your question as best as I understand it. Uh, where are the ISIS fighters in uh, Syria? Right now they're in uh, eastern Syria. Uh, the fighters that I'm most concerned with go from Raqqa. Uh, sort of north central Syria, and they go down the Euphrates River Valley to the southeast to Abu Kamal. Um, and then they extend southward into the Hamad Desert area, uh, uh, and they extend northward up towards a town called Shadadi, and there's a river there called the Kaaba River. And uh, they generally uh, are, lay in that area along the Euphrates River Valley and the Kaaba River Valley uh, in this area we call the Middle Euphrates River Valley and they extend into uh, western Anbar in Iraq. So uh, that's where ISIS is uh, and that's where our campaign is focused on driving into that Middle Euphrates River Valley where if you recall I mentioned and, and the Secretary of Defense mentioned about a week ago that's where we envision their last stand will be made. Uh, then, as far as your uh, concern, your question about starving them out, I didn't quite get that, but it's this is a huge, huge area, and uh, there are significant agriculture that goes on in this area, uh, livestock being raised, crops being grown. So, uh, when they're in a small city, you can have uh, some ability to starve them out, and that's what we try to isolate. We do is we isolate these towns. Uh, and uh, in fact, Talafer, there were significant food shortages in Talafer.